Welcome to Evolve to Succeed, the podcast that brings together entrepreneurs, founders, business leaders, and experts to talk about their journeys and explore the link between personal and business success. I'm your host, Juan Munson, founder of Evolve, a coaching, training, and development company focused on enabling business and personal success and creating a community of like-minded individuals. Whether that be through our peer groups, one-to-one coaching, our training and development programs for you and your teams, or through our content and events, our mission is to get the best out of each individual and inspire them to be better both in life and in business. If you want to learn more about Evolve, including our beautiful co-working space in Ashley Cross in Paul, then please go to evolvemembers.com where you'll find great content, insights, details of all of our services, and also information on our forthcoming events. For now though, let's get on with the show. Welcome, this week we hear from Jamie Sargent, global CEO and founder of Crowd, a multi-award winning global creative agency that specializes in amplifying demand for brands around the world. And he definitely does what he preaches. He has a global business, still independent, still owner managed with five offices around the world. I was really excited to get Jamie as such an obviously passionate and ambitious individual on the show and our conversation today ranges from topics such as navigating the complexities of running a global business, the value of encouraging failure, how to monitor the success of a marketing campaign, the effects of AI on the future of digital marketing and his reasons for making the business B Corp certified. Please do enjoy the conversation. Welcome, Jamie, to the Evolved to Succeed podcast. Thank you ever so much, Warren, and um, thank you for you and your listeners. Yeah, well, it's been great to have you on the podcast. I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation today. I want to cover off some of your expertise around marketing insights and mar- how we overcome some marketing challenges as business owners. I uh, want to also talk about globalization and doing business globally, because that's a key part of both crowd your business and you know, how you support your client base but we should probably put some context around your story uh, with our listeners so as i understand it you founded crowd in october 2012 that's correct um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and how crowd came about I, well i first started um, my, my career has always been design so i've worked across a variety of different areas in in design predominantly illustration with um, with disney and warner brothers and then i started an agency in 99 and um, built that up to being uh, to sort of one of the uk's um, leading digital agencies and then i sold my equity in that in 2012 because I wanted to focus more on a global audience. Okay. So that was the birth of, of Crowd. So, so a very specific thing to go global. Absolutely. A lot of that was because um, I saw an opportunity that uh, my then business partners, I don't think, saw. So, um, so I took the opportunity to, to start Crowd. And I had a lot of support from the Arts um, University. Okay. So when we first started, we were on campus at the Arts University oh, in Bournemouth. Okay. In one of the incubator sort of spaces. Yeah, in the Enterprise Pavilion. Yes. And um, along with, you know, many other of the sort of leading agencies around, uh, around sort of Dorset now. So, yeah. you know, you've got some... If, if you think about how many people have now been employed by business, that were incubated there yeah. it would be astonishing yeah so so it's, yes it's a proof isn't it i sort of gone off track slightly already but it's a proof isn't it for you know all around the country that these incubators exist but how successful they can be but in particular that incubator rat that was running at that time in bournemouth really started to put bournemouth on the map as a creative a digital uh, center isn't it absolutely and i think it's access to the to the talent so yeah. for us what worked really really well was we developed a program uh, that worked with students um and and then what we would do is train them we'd pay them um you know more money than they would get sort of at tesco's or vodka revolutions or somewhere yeah. like that and um and just incubate that talent and, and now you know i think one of the biggest success stories for for that is is tom who now runs the office in dubai um and they've got about 25 staff so it's um it wow. was a brilliant program and i think anybody that was on it um has, has has really gone forward to succeed in their in their careers so having access to that talent the support of um of of 
the Arts University and Bournemouth University was absolutely key to our mm. success. It's interesting. It's good. Maybe we'll touch on a bit later that co- collaboration between the sort of you know the education sector and business because it doesn't always work so smoothly but I know you're quite passionate about that subject so if I remember we'll come back to it (laughs) but back to your story I mean how did it feel then so you'd you know been started a business in 99 grown it obviously had by the sounds of it fellow director shareholders decided you wanted to take a different change of direction 2012 set up crowd go global how did it feel to go from sort of a business you'd grown and, and then exit to start again, because <laughs> not many do that. No, I think it was, uh, you could almost sort of deem it like a divorce. Um, so it, it wasn't an easy thing to go through. But at the same time, uh, I was pretty determined that, uh, yeah. that it was the right thing to do. And for me personally, I just wish I'd done it sort of when I'd thought about it a couple of years before. Yeah. So it was, I, I think as well, having... Uh, the the decisions to to sort of die on your own sword, so mm, to speak, okay. um, is you know. Whereas at my last agency, I was I, I founded it with with one partner, and then we brought another partner in, and three people in charge is not yeah. a good yeah. not a good space to be in. <laughs> so um, crowd has um, have, yeah been able to sort of make make our own decisions, and, and you've really seen that dynamic play out. That actually being in control of your own destiny. And actually being the sole founder, Absolutely. director is something you enjoy because people, some people kind of prefer the partnership and having mm. the support and some people kind of prefer the loan journey and you've clearly decided which one you prefer. Absolutely. For me personally, it's, it's worked uh, very well. We've made lots of mistakes. Yeah. Uh, continue, <laughs> continue to make <laughs> lots of mistakes. And, um, but I think having built one agency you know you learn sort of some of the ropes so the second mm. one is kind of a bit more of a fast track okay. because you've you've made mistakes and and picked up from them so it was uh, very much a blank canvas and because of you know because I started the previous agency um, there were some contractual reasons mm. for not dealing with certain clients so the uh, the natural thing was to to work globally okay it's interesting and so to put it into context for our listeners you know, 11 years on, we're now in 2023. You know, where's Crowd at now? So we are about 70 staff, um, full-time staff, and, and probably about 10 freelancers um, in seven different countries. Okay. Um, and we help businesses, brands, and governments into new territories. Okay. So we have 25 different nationalities on staff, and we speak about 17 different languages. Wow. Um, so most of what we do it tends to be focused around helping a, a brand, a business, or a government culturalize their work into a new territory. Okay. So really understanding each of the cultures where we're positioned, you know, geographically, um, with people on the ground, uh, enables us to deliver campaigns that, that work. So I think, you know, if you were to look at to try and just go into a new country without the knowledge mm. and the cultural nuances, um, then then it's going to be almost impossible. It won't work. And in certain, t- you know, certain places, you know, if we would have put, so some of the campaigns that we've done, you know, if we would have put the same creative um, in Saudi Arabia uh, as we would in, in, you know, in an Eastern European country, we would have gone to prison mm-hmm. um, because they both audiences want different things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, particularly, uh, particularly for, you know, a, a lot of the work that we do is, it's understanding what what's trending in that in that particular territory yeah. at the time, so as we can um, pick up on that and deliver campaigns and you know, propositions that that really resonate with that local audience, which I think you know culturally um, people like that. Mm. You know, you've taken the time to to, to localize something, and you can do that because of presence. And I suppose and that presence must be worldwide. Then is it? Yeah. So we are our offices are in San Francisco, New York. Uh, Bournemouth as the yeah. head office, um, London, Amsterdam, Madrid, Berlin, Dubai, Chengdu and Shenzhen in China and Sydney, Australia. Wow. So we've got pretty good coverage. South America um, might need a look at in the future. Okay. And, and But a big, big growing market for us is the Middle East. Okay. So um, we're, we're just about to expand into Saudi Arabia. Um, okay. We've got a really good foothold in 
uh, in Dubai. And there's a market that's, that's really exciting. You know, they're doing some incredible things. Brilliant. And we're, we're going to talk about definitely some challenges of globalization and, and building a global business. But so typically you're, you know, is there a particular project that perhaps could put this into light for, you know, our listeners? Is there something you're particularly proud of? that you've, you've I, done for a customer? I, I mean, pretty much everything, um, to be honest. And that's, I think, another thing, the difference between my last agency and this. You know, there hasn't been one piece of work that we've done that we wouldn't put in our portfolio. Yeah. So making sure that you're super proud of it and, um, and the team involved in, you know, working on it. You know, these aren't... There's a labour of love, you know, and you yeah. need to put passion into something. And, and then I think, you know, both clients can feel it, but an audience can also feel it. So, you know, just doing work for money um, hasn't been a focus for, for, for crowd. Um, our focus has been on delivering, you know, our business plan. The original three word business plan was do amazing work yeah. because you'll have happy That's staff. That. Um, and if you've got happy staff, then you'll have happy clients yeah. and then the clients will recommend you to their friends, hopefully. <laughs> and has the journey been what you've expected? I mean, second time round, 11 years in, you know, 70 staff, seven locations, that's great success. Is that what you anticipated and planned? I don't think you can ever plan everything. Um, but I think being open to opportunities yeah. uh, is, is absolutely key. And I think the joy of, only, of just being one person that can make the decisions, obviously I have a board of, yeah. of advisors, but um, that ability to move quickly, uh, I think, you know, does put you in a position that you can capitalise on, on some of the opportunities that, uh, that are presented to you. Trust yourself, believe in yourself, yeah. trust your team, believe yeah. in your team, and, and, and off you go. And, you know, em- empowering your team to make decisions yeah. as well. So it's not all about uh, me at all. Yeah. It's, you know, I've got incredibly talented team that are doing their own thing and you know what what is fantastic is when they report it to you and you know you had nothing to do with it <laughs> yeah. and it's just like that's amazing how do you, you know yeah share that with the rest of the team because that's a that's a great um asset and, and every country's got an in country md driving the presence yeah so we have what we we, we sort of term as country heads and okay. then we have some global roles yeah. so we have um, a coo next to me and um, we have a global traffic manager we have finance um and uh, we've also got some elements of strategy at global level okay and then each of the teams is kind of a blueprint of, of each other yeah so in territory this in is territory what it looks like. this, this is, is what yeah. you do this is your services yeah. and and we can help each other out so th- there's a couple of things that uh, staff have, have suggested and one of them is you know we we all code in the same way so okay. if it's a website that we're building um, then you know if you were to look at the code it would be exactly the same as the one that they're building in the US or they're building in, mm-hmm. in the Netherlands or they're building in so that way should anybody else need to pick it up you know we are one big team mm-hmm. um, but we have it so as you know each of the teams has its own p l you know each each company is owned by the uh, parent company yeah. um so we're one big team, but every office has its own p l has some responsibility yeah. for what they do and what they do yeah and how do you i suppose this is starting to touch on running a global business, but how do you because that consistency sounds great, but how do you ensure and how do you drive that consistency? I think by setting out a good framework and also being inclusive to, you know, I think everybody at Crowd has a voice mm. and I will listen to it. Um, you know, I hope I always, Im- I once saw something that Richard Branson said, employ people that are better than you. <laughs> <laughs> and in my case, that's not too tricky. So um, I have uh, always taken, I've always thought that was um, uh, a really good, mm. uh, a really good piece of advice. Um, and, you know, I take lots of advice yeah. from 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 whole bunch. I've had so many, you know, very clever people help me. Um, you know, not to mention that, you know, the uh, the DBT, so yeah. the Department of um, Business and Trade, um, they've been a massive help to us. Um, and, 
you know, with that, uh, I'm also an export champion. Um, so and for that, I give up some of my time helping other businesses that look to export, you know, mm. with um, ideas and insights into into those yeah. into those territories. Because, like you say, setting up, you know, there's a lot of learning yeah. in setting up a business in China. There's yeah. a lot of learning in setting up a business in um, in Dubai. Yeah. Not so much now, but when we did it, there was. Yeah. Um, and, and, and equally so, because you forget sometimes in the UK, you know, you can start a company, to, you know, this afternoon yeah. and you can be trading tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so and that's, I think, one of the, the, the really strong points about the entrepreneurism within the UK. Um, but it's not the same in other countries. No. <laughs> uh, you know, I've done it for clients across the world. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it can take months. It months. It's yeah. Not, yeah, yeah. So, and and even when you've done it, then you stumble across some other challenges yeah. that you know you then have to uh, think about. Okay, how do I get around this? Yeah, definitely. And therefore, I mean, it's probably a good time to ask you the question that you know if you did have a business owner in front of you that ran their own successful owner-managed business in the UK, offering either services or products and wanted to expand and export mm. and set up a presence maybe in the Middle East or in the Far East. Have you got two or three hints and tips that Ab- you'd give? Absolutely. The first one is um, speak to the Department of Business and Trade. Okay. Um, really they, helpful, aren't they? They are really helpful and um and they will open doors for you that you wouldn't be able to open by yourself um and they have uh, consulates in each of these areas so you know and it's their job to enable and to help and support businesses um with export so that would be my first tip mm. the second tip would be you know really understand the the culture there mm. so you know don't go in thinking that you can do it the same way that you have in the UK yeah. you have to be super flexible and you know as a, you, you will get punched you will get knocked down you know it is just a case of getting back up and and keep on trying and I think being sort of determined is 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 the key mm. um so that that I would say is you know expect some 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 yeah. hurdles um so it's not going to be a smooth journey um dbt and other organizations um can make it really uh, a lot smoother mm. um and then I think from a, obviously from a marketing uh, standpoint, um, making sure that you're working with a company um, like Crowd, no, that, uh, that really understands that territory um, yeah. because the nuances of, I mean, just, you know, if you look at something like the Middle East, um, then, you know, understanding how you can get your product out there, you know, and do your proper market research. So as you really understand, is there demand for that, you know, for the product? Yeah. Is there something about that product that culturally wouldn't sit with that market? Yeah. Um, then, yeah, planning. And then, you know, go to market and expect to, to you, you know, to give it as much time as you yeah. had to give your business in the UK. Um, because if you, you know, quite often, I mean, now the UK office, um, it still, still performs very well, but the Middle East is, is far outperforming yeah. us, you know, the UK. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. And uh, what about the effects on you as an individual running a global business? Because, you know, you you've got your presence in the UK, this is where your home is. I know we've got technology and all of those kind of things, but sometimes you've got to put your feet on the ground and, mm. and actually see what's going on here what's on, and spend time with your team with the team yeah and how have you found that as a challenge i i've always enjoyed travel okay i've i've you know from from my very earliest of jobs i had to travel a fair amount yeah um i find it really inspiring uh, I, I enjoy eating uh, different uh, cultures' foods. Yeah. Um, I've eaten some shocking things in China, <laughs> but um, and 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 around the world. So I've always enjoyed travel and providing, you know, understanding cultures and and being treated, you know, by locals to for for them really explaining their culture to you. Mm. I find that as you know, forever learning. So um, and if you can then. You know, what I've spotted is different ways of doing, you know, prior to all of this, I worked um, in uh, overseas. So I've seen how different cultures work. Um, 
And if you take, you know, I've seen some, you know, Canadians do something that I think is really special or the Chinese or the Hong Kongese um, doing stuff, which you just think, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. So it's if, when you pull all of those little bits of, um, of, of, I guess, history and technique together, yeah. then, then you come up with something fairly interesting. Yeah, I suppose the key to that is always having that open mind, isn't it? Yeah. yeah and don't learning from things yeah. and being prepared to adapt. Absolutely. And then reapply yeah those practices elsewhere if you think they're going to work and and you know don't be frightened to fail yeah um because you know if you've learned something from it it's not failing no. um so i know i encourage my team not to make silly mistakes but i encourage them to fail because if we're not failing we're not innovating yeah. um and you know our clients come to us for innovation and you know especially at the moment where you've had this huge speed up of um, of AI mm. and tech and you know it's a it's a very different landscape almost every month yeah so we need to be uh, embedded into you know that level of innovation to, to be able to offer it to our clients and you see a different speed of innovation across the world and the ad- yes. adoption of certain technologies as they emerge yeah absolutely and it, what's really interesting is you you know you you think of places like america you think that oh you know they're they're so far advanced and mm. and everything else they still use checks yeah um uh, you know which is it would seem to us as being insane okay you know <laughs> archaic you know when you, you reflect that to china where they're using iris scanning for payments yeah. then you've got you've got you know miles apart so absolutely i think that different cultures take technology and it depends as well i think in the uk we've got a lot of you know history here mm. um and there's there's been ways of doing things yeah um Whereas some countries like Dubai, you know, wasn't there in, you know, it's a blank canvas. Yeah. So, and I think what you'll see with um, some of these new uh, developments and progressions within Saudi Arabia is going to be incredible. You know, some of the the things that I'm seeing um, and the team are working on, they will embrace tech to the next, you know, to the next degree. Um, And you can only really do that if you've got a blank canvas. Yeah. So some of these smart cities, you just, you know, unless you were building it completely, uh, you know, in Greenland in the UK, yeah. it wouldn't, um, you, you couldn't do it technically. Yeah. And you still have a lot of red tape and regulation, yeah. which, you know, some of these places yeah, they, they don't, they don't. don't have. No. Yeah, and, and that's an advantage and I'm sure a disadvantage at times. And I suppose that kind of leads on to some questions around marketing itself, because you know, you, you're representing some, you know, governments, global businesses of all different shapes and sizes. But one of the things all of us in business would struggle with is how do we actually monitor the success of a marketing campaign? And then again, I suppose I come back to any hints, tips, thoughts. It, I advice? think I think to measure the success, you need to have a clear objective as to what you're looking to actually achieve. What does success look like? And and then you would tend to model it back from there. So if it is, um, if you know, if it's a service service sort of led business, then your objectives are going to be very different to um, to if it's a product led business. Mm. And and we deal with 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 both. Or it could be marketing a country. So therefore, does success look like visitors into the country, mm. or does it does success look like that the time that they've had when they're in that country and how you can turn them into an ambassador um, that that will do more marketing for you than any campaign yeah. ever. So it depends on the objectives and really understanding what the business um, is trying to achieve. Because I would argue that, you know, if you're looking at destination marketing, if you can, you know, there's getting a thousand people on a plane, but if you can get hundred people on a plane that have the most amazing time and then become ambassadors for that that region or for that country then that's going to last forever um and 
so yeah so to 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 really to answer your question is a tricky one because it depends on what the objective is um quite often it would be clicks or visits to a website um, or filling out a lead form yeah um so that's a bit easier to do not easier but that's um that's a fairly easy kpi i need a hundred leads because um if i can get those leads at x um, and i convert 10 percent of them i'm going to be in business or, or so and do you think business owners generally, you know, independent business owners don't plan enough ahead of their marketing campaigns? Do you think they're throwing darts at a dartboard? I think it can be an afterthought sometimes because okay. they're so busy running their business yeah. that um, that they don't, you know, think about what's, you know, the next year or, or the next six months. Yeah. So I think strategically, um, if you you know if you're working with and as well it's working with a partner so you know we we've got some very good long-term relationships you know I think our longest client relationships nine years so it's you know you're you're an extension of their team you really understand their business you know we're very proactive in how we sell so we will be sending our clients ideas and suggesting that hey have you have you thought about this? We've just done a bit of a, a market survey. Um, this competitor's doing this. This competitor's doing this. Um, we feel you should do this. Or there's an opportunity to uh, to own a space. Yeah. So, and and again, I guess as an agency, we tend not to. I mean, a brief is great, but what we tend to like to do is is sort of really understand what the real problem is, mm-hmm. and then. And, and then work with clients to deliver a solution for that. Yeah. Um, I, but I suppose, again, there's this thing, isn't it, about, you know, product service market fit, isn't yeah. there? Yeah. And you suppose you talked about that in the globalization is, as business owners, do we really know what our offering is? Yeah. Is there a need for it? Is there a desire for it? Yeah. And, and are we fitting that market? And you know, you might be one thing to one person in one country, yeah. but another person, another thing to another person, in another country. So, because that might not work, that proposition that, you know, that we would create, would it, maybe that works really well for the American market. Yeah. Whereas for the Chinese market, it needs to be something completely different. Um, so it's conceptualizing that and then, and then delivering it, you know, but we, as an agency you know understand that our clients you know need to have objectives and kpis so we will agree those before we do anything and then deliver to those Uh, and that way happy clients and we mentioned just now sort of technology and you used the words ai so probably need to touch on that don't we in terms of just the general world out there in terms of sales marketing and what effect is AI going to have on digital marketing in the world, do you think? Oh, everything. You know, it's uh, we're at a point now that things are moving so, so fast. Um, yeah. It's almost unbridled. You, you can't, um, unfortunately, and I'm saying unfortunately because I think, you know, personally that someone should have put a bit of a block on this or put mm-hmm. some rules around it, but they haven't. Yeah. So the cat's out, it's, the, bag, the, cat's out the bag and, yeah. and it's, you know, so, you know, we're working closely with um, academia as well around AI and um, and developing our own set of um, products, okay. um, but also using it for, for, for clients. Mm. So we realize that, if if we don't, you know, and I saw a really good um, thing on LinkedIn that's that you know AI won't take your job, yeah. but someone that understands it will. Yeah, and uh, and I think that's very true. Um, you know, you what's possible with it, if you know, with the right sort of thought and process, is just incredible. Um, and it it it's going to speed things up massively. Well, it is for us already. Yeah. So I think being transparent about it yeah. as well, saying so to clients hiding that, away from it. Yeah, yeah, no, and just saying, look, we're using AI for this because it's going to save you money. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you know, that's how we can add value to it. Um, and you, s- it's interesting, that do you, as a marketeer, do you see that content's going to be so unique as it once was or is it going to become a bit more generic? 
Oh, I think that, you know, AI generated content is already starting to litter the internet. Yeah. Um, I read a rec- I, I was watching another podcast just recently about the, you know, the death of the internet due to the over spamming of AI based content. Yeah. And you've got things like the, you know, the, the presidential run coming up next year in the US. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just going to be. In, you know, a mess, yeah. as it was yeah, for Brexit was, yeah. in, you know, with the Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. So we know that it's, the, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 we know that it's there. We know what it can yeah. do um, and it can influence people to make, you know, the wrong decisions or just misinformation. Yeah. Um, but, it, but the challenge is, isn't it, is how do you still stand out from the crowd Yeah. when there's so much content being pushed out there now? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Having that connection with with a customer yeah. and um, and providing something that's making their life easier uh, is is always you know people will always want that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I think things will start to go into sort of more siloed communities, you know, uh, okay. because you will be searching desperately for the truth, um, okay. and it's going to be you know. But everything is AIable now, mm. so you know there's. What the, is the truth? Yeah, exa- <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, and the, the, that's why I said, you know, my original thing of saying I wish someone had put some yeah. framework around this, um, almost to say, right, this is all AI stuff over here. Yeah. This is all truth over here, um, but they haven't, and no. um, and it, it's going to be an interesting, you know, and it's an interesting dynamic for you as a business both as a business but how you serve your clients because mm. at some point there may be some and there probably will be some regulation but different countries will adopt different regulation won't they and how do you respond to that is going to be a challenge isn't it, it yeah absolutely but I, I mean th- there will be some some standards but then culturalizing things um you know is is what we do but then ai can also do that um so for i, th- I think yeah, I, I, I don't personally have a like, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, but all, all, I'm encouraging all of my teams um, to, to, to be, you know, have a very good understanding of what is possible. But again, tomorrow something else is possible yeah. and it is moving that fast. Okay. So interesting times, yeah, you know. It. So does it excite you or scare you? Both, yeah. in honesty, and there are elements of it that's incredible, you know, incredible moves for, you know, in- incredible sort of trajectory and speed forward. Yeah. Um, at the same time, you know, you sh- everybody should be concerned about, you know, can AI do that role? Yeah. So, you know, but luckily, because we're in the creative space, then that is, you know, thought and, and yeah. human sort of insights. Um, it's not there yet from an AI perspective. Yeah. Um, I've been told by 2028, AI will be as intelligent as humans. Um, and shortly after that, much more intelligent. Yeah. Um, it's, so it's how we use it um, for, for our advantage and for our clients' advantage. Yeah. Um, without it taking over. <laughs> exciting times. It is exciting. You know, <laughs> exciting it, and scary at the same time. It, yeah, as, yeah, very much so. As, as you responded to the question. I, I have to ask, kind of from a, you know, from a business perspective and from being a business owner, where it feels like my life, you know, at times you're just 24-7, you're on it, you can't shut down, your mind doesn't shut off. And, that's, and I've only ever run UK businesses. Hmm. You, know? you throw time zones into the mix. And, <laughs> yeah. um, but when you throw time zones into the mix and having and running a business, you know, mm. how does that, you know, how do you get balance in life? It excites me. So, and, and I've never been someone to enjoy watching, um, uh, you know, a soap opera. Yeah. Um, so I would much rather be uh, exploring what we could be doing yeah. and, um, and coming up with ideas for, um, for how we can be better yeah. so I don't know I guess if, if you're asking about sort of work-life balance mm. then I think when you own a business there's always going to be an element of uh, of you know being able to switch off but I've I've become a lot better at it yeah. as I've now got a really you know incredible team yeah. and I think it, it, it I don't know maybe after about 
30, 40 people, you realise the fact you can't do all of this yeah. yourself, you know, and you can't be the only person. So it's by empowering an incredible team yeah. that has enabled us to grow to, to where we are now and, there is, and scale now. And there is some step changes, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. Come, you know, definitely those early days, it is everything and you yeah. go on top of everything. But yeah. actually the great point in business, isn't it, is that when you can get to that size where you can have some structure... <sighs> And, and you can empower and you can trust and yeah. you can let go and, and employ people that are better than you and let them do their thing and oversee. Yeah. Then I suppose you do get some balance back. So that is a good response. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, you know, at first, you all know this, you know, you do everything from payroll to every invoice yeah. to every, you know, or, uh, literally you do yeah. all of the major uh, sort of business functions. Um but now to have a team of people that take care of that far better than I would have done, um, are, you know, that's, I, I guess, a, a massive sense of, um, not re- yeah, relief and, and also just how cool is this? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and we touched on it as we were just having a pre-discussion as I was setting up, James. So I, I suppose you being a global business, I don't really want to focus too much on the discussion on it because it's, hopefully it's a time that's past us. But... You know, there was that moment of COVID. Ah. 2020, eight years into the business. Mm. Yeah, you know, mostly um, destination uh, marketing and travel and tourism clients. Yeah. Um, just in the, um, in the February of 2020, I was about to set up an aviation department. Okay. Um, <laughs> so right. thankfully I didn't. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, But again, I would say that, you know, we made it through that uh, as a team. Yeah. So everybody, everybody pulled together. And actually what it did do was beforehand, I was the only one um, that was, you know, traveling around all of the different offices. And so I knew, you know, all of the staff, but not all of the staff knew all of the staff. Okay. So what we did during COVID was as a, we had a global roundup every day. So everybody got to meet the team, uh, the wider team. Okay. And that meant that I think we all felt as if we were in it together. Um, yeah. And I didn't want to furlough anybody because I didn't think it was fair on, on some people having to do double the amount of work and others yeah. being paid and not. Um, and I know some friends that, or some you know colleagues that sort of did the furlough thing, but week on, week off. Mm. Um, but I, I didn't want to furlough anybody because we had lots of work on um, that we needed to, to, to deliver. So reducing the size of the team would have just um, would have been too much. We did. Everybody did take a pay cut. Um, yeah. And it took, I think, about two and a half months before we could then start to get the, you yeah. know, the, the wages back on yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, wages back to where they were. It's interesting so, that you say it helped to connect you as a business to make you a stronger businesses in terms of communication in a team, isn't it? Yeah. I think there's a lot of businesses that saw that as the advantage yeah. post the pandemic. However scary it was during it to be running a during it to run a business. Yeah, oh yeah, for us, um, it was it was you know I don't think I, unless you were um, selling alcohol then I don't think um, <laughs> <laughs> I think most businesses you know it was you were hit in some way yeah. uh, for, for for us we were with with you know but we took that as an opportunity to really look at us um, it was the first year that we'd ever not grown yeah. you know we we went down in turnover um, so and that's that's humbling. Because when you're growing, you know, everything's just go, go, go. You know, you don't, you're not, you don't have many breaks. No. Um, but, you know, going through that experience um, gave us uh, far, you know, we, we really had a look at the way that we're working and how can we be more efficient. We also took it as a, an opportunity to look at um, getting B Corp certification. Oh, okay. So sort of changing the way that, that we work in order to... Uh, to, to be better people and you know, and have you done that have you gone through that process we have we're just um waiting i'm going to press the, i'm going to touch the wood here um yes yeah, so we have it's been a long process for us mm. because we originally did it just for the uk company and then we had to do it for the entire 
global business okay. and you know there's a lot of aircon being used in in Dubai yeah. um, and you know of course, yeah. so so we had to make quite a lot of changes um, but we're now carbon neutral as a as a company as of this year wow. and I'm hoping thank you um, I'm really hoping that we will um, uh, you know we have a plan that we want to be uh, carbon positive by 25 okay. so next year our major focus is that um, all of our supply chain and you know all of the ad serving that we do is all using green energy so as we can really try and reduce down all of our carbon footprint for yeah. not just us as a business but all the work that we do yeah, as well I think you're outsourcing yeah. you put out there so so that's that, that which has been a really good focus yeah. you know it's um i think the pandemic I, you know you realized just that whole slowing down you know, on my walk to the beach every day, I noticed animals I hadn't seen since I was a mm. child. Um, so I think that also really inspired, you know, us cause I, as a team to, uh, to 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 want to try and think about your impact. think about our impact and um, and and thankfully we have, and it's you know been a great. Uh, it, it, it's been a really good success. There's a lot of rigor behind that B Corp status, isn't oh, there? There is, and you know, the, the, yeah, very much so. Um, and we've had to change quite a lot of the way that we work. Yeah. Um, so that was quite a big shift um, for us, um, and you know, still is. Yeah. Which, um, but I think a, a shift for the better. Yeah. Um, and did you do it because of that effect of the business on the environment? Did you see it as? an opportunity to have that certification puts you in a different place in the market. You know, what were your real motivators for it? Yeah, yeah. I think, well, we've always supported um, uh, Plastic Oceans as a, as a client, uh, as a non-for-profit. And we've, we, you know, we've done a lot of work for them for, for, for free. We do with Dorset Mind as well. Yeah. Um, and I figured that we had, for the first time ever, you know, we had time. So it was... It was brought to me by one of the team, and I said, "Yeah, let's let's do it." Okay. Um, so, I also believe that from a, I mean, obviously, you know, like you, I've got two two young yeah. daughters, and we want to try and leave the world a slightly better place for them. Um, and doing even, you know, doing a small thing is better than doing nothing. Yeah. Um, so. I also think that, you know, look forward a few years and procurement will be uh, looking down the list, the tick boxes, um, you know, and with another thing, we've got ISO certified this year um, with things like ISO certification and B Corp certification. I think that uh, we'll we'll tick some more boxes, yeah. which will hopefully give us a competitive yeah. advantage. No, I think that's one of the great things about B Corp, I think, is it, it makes you, you know, proper business with purpose and doing business in a proper way. And doing it environmentally and treating your people well and all of those kind of things but i think it's not shy in saying there needs to be some commercial benefit to but doing yeah. that as well because yeah. that's how oh. the world will change yeah and us as business owners will yeah adopt absolutely and leave the world in hopefully a slightly better place yeah so uh, i i think it's a it's a brilliant initiative yeah and um and, and it's made a positive change on on staff as well so and i think people you know the team enjoy um uh, enjoy working for a company that does you know carry those values brilliant and when we come back to it and we start to wrap up um we've got to talk about kind of the local business environment um and i'm really intrigued that you're still a guest lecturer to the university we started the conversation talking about yeah that's something university. that's something that i'm i'm looking to do more of and working more with universities not just here in the uk but also um you know a big initiative uh, for all of my country heads is working with academia yeah. um tapping into that raw talent uh, was the success for for us in our early days of uh, of crowd we're now 10 and um, it's time to sort of go back to our roots and uh, and looking at working with with academia across uh, across the globe Brilliant. so yeah very much something that I'm I'm interested in doing and you know selfishly you get to spot talent yeah so and if we're able to to create a platform as we did um, when we started Crowd to sort of nurture that talent and, and offer them internships, not just here in the UK, but, you know, we've actually got something quite exciting to offer them now. You know, we can yeah. say, where do you want to um, have an internship in one of our offices? So um, I think that's something. Yeah. Watch this space uh, that we're going to be doing a lot more of. Fantastic. I 
always finish the podcast with this simple question. Well, it's probably not that simple, but the question, what's your definition of success, Jamie? Oh, my definition of success is in enjoying the journey. Yeah, fantastic. And if people want to learn more about you, more about the crowd, where can they go? Uh, if you go to uh, thisiscrowd.com, um, you'll be able to learn all about us or on our social medias. Brilliant, Jamie. I've loved having you a guest on the Evolve to Succeed podcast. Thank you ever so much for your time. It's been great to meet you. Thank you for listening to the Evolve to Succeed podcast. My hope with every episode is that you've learned something new or heard something that challenged your way of thinking and further motivated you on your path towards becoming a more knowledgeable, informed and inspired individual and business leader. If you enjoyed this episode, then please help us by rating, reviewing and subscribing. We really value your feedback and would love to have you along for future episodes. And please don't forget to learn more about Evolve by going to evolvemembers.com. Thank you for listening. See you next week.